Surely so. Um, but uh, we're going to start recording now, and as, uh, as those people on the stream will have, will have heard that, unfortunately, we've had some technical issues this morning. So uh, this is the sermon that Shirley uh, delivered to the Canal Basin this morning, and uh, we, hope you'll, uh, we hope that God will speak to you through it. But I'm going to pray for Shirley now before she comes and joins us. Uh, so, Father, we do thank you for Shirley. We thank you for all the preparation she's put into this. We thank you for her knowledge for her love for you and her passion for her faith. And I pray now that you will bless Shirley, that she will speak to us and that indeed you will speak to her. Amen. Shirley. Nice to take that off. Well, if you've been following the series over the last few weeks, then you'll know that we've been going through the book of Mark, his account of what Jesus did and what he said. And we're going to carry on with that today with a very short passage, which in many ways is just a simple account of a healing. But there are some points that stand out, and it would be nice to have a look at them together. But first of all, let's start with some context, the broader picture of what was going on. Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate what would be their last Passover together. The disciples would have been apprehensive, but still hoping to see the power of Rome overthrown, wondering what their positions would be in the new kingdom Jesus had spoken about so often. They'd seen him do miracles, they'd heard him teach, and they had high hopes. But they were also struggling a bit with his most recent teaching. In fact, if you read all of Mark chapter 10, you'll see that the disciples weren't doing very well at all. Jesus spoke of dying and being raised from the dead. And it wasn't the first time he'd said it. And they just didn't understand. Why would he come to die? He was the Messiah, wasn't he? Then they'd been rebuked for not allowing children and their parents access to Jesus. Been puzzled to find that Jesus apparently didn't see wealth as proof that someone was at least close to God's kingdom, if not actually in it. And had been challenged by Jesus saying that they should become like children. And most recently by him teaching that instead of looking for high positions, which they had been doing, they should serve others. In fact, their understanding of who Jesus was and what he was doing could be described as a work in progress. In fact, if you think about it, that is also true for us. And if you have doubts about how well you're progressing, well, read Philippians 1, verse 6, when you have a moment. Philippians 1, verse 6. But for now, let's turn to Mark, chapter 10. And our reading starts from verse 46, through to the end of the chapter. Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man... Bartimaeus, that is, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. 
So Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd with him are passing through Jericho. As was quite usual for a rabbi or a teacher at the time, when travelling, there was a crowd, a crowd of people there to listen to him teaching, which he would do while walking along. But of course, other people would also have been on the road. Some may well have been priests. Jericho was a city where over 12,000 priests lived when they weren't on duty in Jerusalem. And they were only in Jerusalem, usually, for two weeks at a time, twice a year except for big occasions like the Passover when they were all expected to be on duty if they were available. And of course, as many Jews as could would be going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover there together. And in that crowd around Jesus would have been many who had seen or heard of his miracles. For those with money to do so, Jericho actually at the time was a nice warm place to stay over winter, but it was also a useful place for pilgrims to stay when they were on their way to Jerusalem. But alongside the wealth of Jericho, there was extreme poverty. The sort of abysmal economic conditions where many had to beg simply to get enough to live on. And Jericho was where a particular blind man was begging. It's a very short account, very easy to just glance over it and think, nice, another miracle, another healing. And wouldn't it be nice to see miracles like that today? But let's just go back over some of these details. First of all, how many of those healed by Jesus can we name? Give yourself just a moment or two there. If you're sitting next to somebody, you might just want to talk together. And if you're at home, of course, you can talk as much as you want. How many of those who were healed by Jesus can we name? Well, give yourself a point if you've got Mary Magdalene, who had seven demons cast out of her, according to Luke. Give yourself another point if you've got Lazarus, he was raised from the dead. That's a fairly serious illness that uh, he was healed from. And then you're probably going to be stopping a moment and thinking, okay, who else? Well, Peter's mother-in-law, do we know her name? No, well, that's half a point because she did get Peter. Jairus' daughter, another half point because we don't know her name either. The widow of Nain's son, we don't even know the widow's name, and certainly not her son's. Most of them were known by their previous illness or disability. Yes? If I've forgotten somebody, then you must come back to me and let me know. So why was he known by name? Interesting question. Another point here, which is remarkable, In a crowd where some at least of them knew that Jesus healed people, nobody helped him. Nobody even said to Jesus, hey, there's a man over there, looks as though he's blind, he's trying to get your attention. How many of them had been healed by Jesus themselves in that crowd? How many knew that Jesus healed people? No one helped this blind man. Why not? Were they so concerned about Jesus, what Jesus was saying, that they didn't even notice him? Or did they think, oh, he's nobody, he's just a beggar, just a nuisance? Do we look out for people we can help? from day to day? Do we offer help to people even if it means sometimes that we are stopped momentarily and what we are doing to do that? This particular beggar had heard something different in the crowds that day and he asked what was going on. Somebody said to him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he put that fact together with what he'd already heard about Jesus 
and what he believed about Jesus. And he was determined he was not going to miss this opportunity to speak to him. He yelled out, shouted loudly enough to seriously annoy some of those wanting to hear what Jesus was saying, not what some poor beggar on the side of the road might have been wanting. And he called Jesus son of David, which is a messianic title, showing that he believed Jesus was the Messiah. He had faith. And you know something else surprising? In that busy crowd, Jesus heard him, heard someone calling his name and stopped. And you can imagine the uh, movement at the back of the crowds as they realise suddenly that the front, that they're not moving anymore. I wonder how many people bumped into somebody at that moment. Jesus called him over. And we can tell because he threw his cloak aside and jumped to his feet that he wasn't physically disabled apart from his sight. And he came to Jesus. And you know, Jesus healed him. And in doing so, highlighted his faith. The faith of a nobody in the mind of the people at the time. But nobody is a nobody in God's sight. And nobody should be a nobody in our sight either. And you know what? Now we know Bartimaeus' name. Healing is always by grace. But without faith, Bartimaeus wouldn't have shouted out to Jesus, wouldn't have asked for any help, and Jesus would have gone by on his way to Jerusalem. But the account finishes with Bartimaeus now healed and following Jesus. And you know what somebody who follows, follows Jesus is? A disciple. Bartimaeus, for at least a short time, and long enough for the other disciples to get to know him by name, was a disciple. And you know, given the fact that he was known by name to Mark, that he showed he had faith in Jesus as the Messiah sent by God and able to heal, and given the fact that he followed Jesus, the most surprising thing to me about Bartimaeus is that we don't hear his name again. He might have been one of the larger group of disciples who formed the early church, maybe. We don't know. But I like to think maybe he was.